So the emotion ontology, um, this was put together um, primarily by Jana Hastings, who is um, an ontologist and bioinformatician working in chem informatics, which is the informatics of chemistry, and metabolism informatics at the European Bioinformatics Institute. The relevance uh, of chemistry to emotions is, I hope, clear. And if it's not clear to you, then we'll go and have a drink later and uh, we'll sort it all out. So before February 2001, this is how biology data would character characteristically be represented. So you would have images uh, or graphs, and this would be associated with text using various technical terms such as chromosome or death or sensation. And from February 2001, increasingly, biology data looks like this. And increasingly, this is the data that not only biologists, but also people doing clinical research have to cope with. And it only gets worse. So the, the, the clinical science is increasingly an information-driven activity. And the problem is that we still, if we're doing clinical science, have to link phenomena such as that represented here or here with data such as that represented here. So there is a problem of linking the new biological data with the old biological data because it's the old biological data which is about things which we find clinically important such as disease or death or well-being. And that is a real problem. And the real problem is the problem of big data. It's the, a problem which uh, the NIH and other organizations are desperately attempting to resolve by uh, various funding um, activities, including something called Big Data to Knowledge, or BD2K, and many others throughout the world. And one important part of such activities is something called the gene ontology, which was created in around about 1999 by Michael Ashburner, who was then professor of genetics at Cambridge, um, who published with his colleagues a paper in Nature Genetics in 2000 called Gene Ontology Tool for the Unification of Biology. The idea behind the tool, the, the gene ontology, is that, first of all, it's not an ontology of genes. It's an ontology of terms used in old biology data, which can be used to describe genes and gene products so that we can associate, for instance, gene sequen sequences or microarray data with terms like death or sex or cell division. Now, this has been immensely successful. I think that this paper has been published 18,000 times, uh, cited 18,000 times in the literature, or uh, some high number of that order. Uh, the gene ontology is now used by very many different kinds of clinical and biological and, and pharmaceutical researchers, and it's received around about $300 million of funding. And what it does is provide species-neutral terms so that you can tag data that you derive from doing experiments on mice or rats or fly in such a way that you can compare those data with what you know about human beings. And thereby, you can make comparisons between, for instance, mouse tumors and human tumors, which would have similar gene genetic or uh, genetic structures or similar physiological uh, processes. And um, the, this is a, a chart showing the use of the term ontology in PubMed abstracts. And PubMed abstracts is the standard res resource of biological and clinical literature. And nearly all of these are references to just one ontology, the gene ontology, which is the turquoise thing here. SNOMED, which Chris knows well, uh, is, is a relative, uh, uh, m relatively minor competitor to the gene ontology for reasons which we will explore later on. SNOMED is the systematized nomenclature for medicine. 
30% roughly of all the papers in genome biology and in other journals mention the GO. So it really is a very important uh, artifact. Now the GO itself is divided into three sub-ontologies. One is the cellular component ontology, which is about things like flagella or chromosomes or cells. The other is the molecular function ontology, which is about things like binding. And then there is the, the really big one, which is biological process ontology, which is about things like death. Now, so this is a picture. The, the ontologies themselves add up to about 30,000 nodes. This is a small fragment of the three ontologies. Uh, if we take the... Um, Biological process ontology down the left, we have axis specification is a kind of pattern specification, which is a kind of development, which is a kind of biological process. So we have 30,000 nodes like that linked together by relations, primarily kind of, or is a, on the one hand, and part of, as for instance in the case, intracellular membrane-bound organelle is, sorry, no, intracellular organelle is a part of the intracellular and the nucleus is a part of the intracellular, and the intracellular is a part of the cell. There are other relations, such as regulates, positively regulates, and so forth. But the GO has no terms for diseases, for molecules, for anatomical structures higher than the level of granularity of the cell, for populations, for experimental methods used by biologists. It only has terms for biological processes, molecular functions, and cellular components. And those terms are res restricted to the representation of normal functioning in the biological realm. So they're not interested in what happens when antelopes get lost in Manhattan. They're interested in what happens to antelopes normally, for instance. Probably they're not interested in antelopes very much at all, but you get the idea. Now, in order to resolve this gap, we founded in 2005 something called the OBO Foundry. OBO stands for Open Biomedical Ontologies. All of these ontologies are completely public domain, open source resources. They are free to steal. The idea behind the OBO Foundry was that we should build on the success of the GO and build other ontologies for things like diseases. So now there is a disease ontology. There are ontologies for proteins, for uh, an anatomical structures, and so forth. And they are arranged in such a way that they interoperate with, that is to say, they reuse the terms and the structures of the GO. So the, 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 uh, the GO ontologies are here in yellow, although it looks green there. Um, and this idea of, of having interoperable suites of ontologies which reuse each other's terms, which are developed in tandem so that you can have a coordinated set of ontologies to represent biological data using terms that scientists use and that clinicians find important, became very successful. So now we have the NIF standard, which is a kind of oboe foundry for neuroscience. We have the VIVO consortium, which is a kind of oboe foundry for describing People involved in, for instance, biological research, so bibliographic data, patent data, and so forth. We have the infectious disease ontology suite, which I'll mention later. We have something called CROP, which is Common Reference Ontologies for Plants, which is funded by the NIH and the European Union to help genomic agriculture. This is a picture of the CROP ontology suite. So you see a lot of it is taken over from the gene ontology and from the OBO foundry. But then there are plant-specific ontologies which are added there, too. And now we have the United Nations Environment Program, which has an ontology framework, uh, the United States Geological Survey, uh, the military up the wazoo, and the Federal Highway Administration. All of them have seen the need in the age of big data to have suites of ontology modules which enable the big data to be annotated, described, tagged in ways which allow comparison and aggregation of data. Now, the rationale here is 
granularity along the vertical axis, so the very small things, molecules, are at the bottom, and we get larger things such as organisms and populations and species and so forth at the top. And then the, along the horizontal axis, we have two ways of existing in time. Uh, on the one hand, we have continuance, which continue to exist through time. Chris is the paradigm example of a continuant. Um, Chris preserves his identity through change. On the other hand, we have occurrence, which are processes, which have temporal parts. And they don't preserve their identity. They unfold themselves in their successive temporal parts. So you, and Chris particularly, are a continuant, and your life is an occurrence. And now functions are continuants, and functionings are occurrence. And I will say that seven times, just so that some people in the room understand it. All right, now, the guidebook to doing all of that I just described is now published, and you can find a 30% discount form over there. <laughs> Uh, so all of this is based on the basic formal ontology, which contains simple terms like a current continuum, function, object, process, and so forth, and shows how to use them to build domain ontologies like the protein ontology or the cell ontology, or, as we will get to in a minute, the emotion ontology. So the BFO comes at the top, and we populate downwards by defining terms at the lower levels using the structures uh, established by means of the terms at the upper levels. And the ontology for general medical science is one of the new ontologies that we've created, which will illustrate the strategy here. Uh, so this is the big picture. We have the etiological process underlying a disease. And at the beginning, there is nothing there. So each day you perform an assay across your body, and the message comes back, no pain, no pain. And then one day, you feel something. And then it gets worse. You have pain. Eventually, you go to the doctor. Now you have a clinical manifestation. The doctor starts to perform tests, isolates specimens, goes around in circle to try and build up a clinical picture. Eventually, the doctor establishes a diagnosis, creates a treatment plan. Now we go around a bigger circle. The treatment at first doesn't work. So you create, you, you perform more tests and so on until eventually you have a treatment plan which cures you, and then you don't die. Now this, all of these terms are in OGMs. So they're all defined logically, they're all organized in a structural way so that you can use the tags using OGM terms to tag either literature or electronic health records or data uh, derived from observation studies and so on in order to organize the clinical data in a way which makes it computationally accessible for different kinds of hypothesis testing or um, uh, fraud detection or plagiarism detection or many other purposes. So we have BFO at the top, then we have OGMs, then we have various more specific disease ontologies such as the infectious disease ontology, each of which is created by its predecessor up the chain by adding new and more specific terms. And then once we have the infectious disease ontology, which is pathogen neutral, it contains terms like virulence or pathogen or vector or infection, we can then very easily create pathogen-specific ontologies such as the IDO staph ontology, the IDO methicillin resistant staph ontology, the IDO Australian methicillin resistant staph ontology, and so on. As new strains of staph aureus are developed, we can create slightly different ontologies in order to allow the data about the patients who ha are suffering diseases from those strains, in order that that data can be annotated and used to draw conclusions, for instance, about which strains will kill you. And now, emotions. So, um, um, emotions are much more difficult to deal with than many of the phenomena which we have developed ontologies to represent. The, the, there is less consistency across the field of the effective sciences. There are different groups who have very different, I'm, I was going to say feelings, but I can't say that, 
very different views about what emotions are. And the, this kind of strategy will only work to the degree that the ontology is neutral as between different views. So if you build an ontology which is going to be acceptable only to those people who accept your very specific views, then the ontology will not create a common source of annotated data which can be acceptable to all the people working in the effective sciences to resolve issues about the nature of emotions, such as, for instance, grief. So we, we tried very hard to find a neutral framework for defining the terms which are relevant to emotional data. Now, there are many types of emotional data. There are, there's neuroimaging data, there's physiological data, there's chemistry data, there's Shakespeare. Um, and all of that data is relevant to the the effective sciences, so people can use all of these kinds of data as sources for understanding what emotions are. And we have used the emotion ontology already to tag several of these different kinds of data. And um, so we have an ongoing project which uses the emotion ontology to, to uh, tag data about emotional responses in animals, first of all. Then we have um, uh, a, a, an experiment to use the emotion ontology as a means of detecting um, emotions in suicide notes. Uh, we have uh, some people who are using the emotion ontology to try to diagnose the kinds of people who are involved in specific kinds of uh, Twitter uh, interactions. Um, we have some, some people using the emotion ontology for cognitive neuroscience experiments. So basically, they're taking brain images of people who are undergoing different kinds of emotions. And this will give you some idea of the terms in the emotion ontology. So we have memory of emotional episode, visual perception of emotional facial expression, auditory, per auditory perception of emotional stimuli, and so on. And we, tr the, we have experiments. Uh, in which people were given tasks of various sorts, and then the outputs from those experiments were annotated using terms like this. And then we have a very interesting one, which I was involved in, with as, in as a subject. We, we, it would be too complicated to do it here because not all of you have laptops. But what we did was we had a large conference of bioinformaticians, and we gave everyone a little program which they could install on their laptop, and then they could tag the speakers who were successively giving talks at this conference according to the emotions that they felt. And so we, you could tag every minute, uh, and you had a, a, a rather wide range of emotions. Um, and it, it, it was an interesting experiment, that's all I can say. You can read the results in the Journal of Biomedical Semantics, which is one of the six or so new ontology journals which exist. And then we have chemical studies. So the role of neurotransmitters such as dopamine and tryptophan in emotions um, are, are well studied. We have a lot of data, and we can uh, now compile this data using the emotion ontology, which is called MFOM, for reasons which I will explain, with uh, terms from the KEBI ontology, which is the chemistry ontology, along with terms from the GO, such as neurotransmitter receptor activity. This is the KEBI ontology. This, the Kebby ontology is huge. This is just the, uh, the, the very small upper level. And it's, it's a fragment thereof. OK, so this is the basic scenario where most of the um, uh, main ideas of the emotion ontology um, are made clear. So this is the person who is going to have the emotional response. Um, Mary does something to him, uh, and I'm assuming it's a he. And he has the, the, the thought, Mary's behavior hurt me. And this is an appraisal, which takes place in the central nervous system. And th this appraisal gives rise to the emotion of feeling angry. And this gives rise to an action tendency, I want to punch, punch something. And I'll explain what action tendencies are in a minute. And that, in turn, is realized in behavior. So this is the dis distinction between 
a, a disposition on the one hand and the realization of a disposition. This is for you, Chris. The two different things. You can have a disposition without ever realizing it. And it also gives rise to physiological responses. So, the emotion occurrent is a mental process. It's a synchronized complex of constituent mental and physical processes, including an appraisal process which gives rise to an action tendency. So we say that that is part of every normal emotion. I will explain what normal emotion is later on. This is the top level of the emotion ontology. Uh, so th it's built down from BFO, which are the blue terms here. And then we have green terms, which belong to the mental functioning ontology. And then m -foam is the emotion extension of the mental ontology, which contains, contains terms like emotional process, sorry, appraisal process, emotion, emotional behavioral process, subjective emotional feeling, and emotion action tendency. Uh, so that's the BFO top with MFO, and that's the emotion ontology, also the top, but it's the bottom of the picture I showed earlier. Now, some people have emotional personality traits, which are continuance, uh, comparable to your height, for instance, or your weight, or your, uh, the color of your skin. So you have an emotional personality trait for a certain period of time. It continues to exist. So it's a stable, enduring characteristic of a person which involves a predisposition to undergo emotions of particular sorts. And uh, there are various emotion processes. Appraisal process is a mental process that gives rise to an appraisal. We have physiological responses to emotion processes, and we have emotional behavioral responses which are behavior of the organism in response to the emotion, including the characteristic fatal ex facial expressions for particular emotional types. Um, that's a Korean, North Korean, or three North Koreans. Emotional action tendencies are dispositions to behavior which inhere in an organism in virtue of physical changes brought about by an emotion process. I want to punch somebody. That's an uh, emotional action tendency. And you, even when you've completed some task, you can still have action tendencies. For instance, to adopt a satisfied facial expression. Now, emotions come with valence. So we need positive valence, negative valence, and then we have neutral, neither positive nor negative. So happiness has positive valence. Not all emotions have any valence. Anger has negative valence. All right, and then we can look at some types of emotion. And you can find this ontology here. Uh, so the whole thing is online. You can look at the definitions and so forth. So um, this, is, this is what you will first of all see, and you can create a visualization according to uh, uh, which part of the ontology you're particularly interested in over here on the right. This is the hierarchy. So physiological response to emotion process includes things like becoming pale, blushing, breathing at a more rapid rate, and so on. Uh, this is um, types of appraisal. Appraisal of pleasantness, appraisal of loss, appraisal of causal intent, uh, all of which are children of appraisal. And this is the same picture on the left with, with slightly bigger types. So appraisal of suddenness. Appraisal of urgency of response, appraisal of familiarity. And each appraisal is a subkind of cognitive representation, which is an MFO. Then we have types of feeling, feeling nervous, feeling in control, feeling at ease, feeling restless, and feeling calm, feeling strong. These are the terms which were primarily used by the conference attendees when they were tagging their experiences of uh, different speakers. Then we have types of physiological response to emotion, shivering, becoming pale, uh, temperature falling, heart beating at a slower rate, and so on. And that's the same thing with bigger type. And now, that's more or less the emotion ontology. That was intended as a very brief survey. Um, we, we need to say something now about the strategy for building ontologies like this. Uh, for reasons which will become clear in a minute. So 
we, as we all know, biological variation is an enormous problem, and it would overwhelm any attempt to create controlled vocabularies like the ones that I have been describing. Not only that, but also the, the range of biological variation changes with time because new strains of diseases evolve and so forth. So in order to solve that problem, we need a strategy. And the strategy consists in creating what we call reference ontologies, which represent what is normal. We use the word canonical in a given biological domain. And then the terms in these reference ontologies are used to build application ontologies which deal with specific cases of disease or mutation or accident where people have to deal with the variations and not just with the canonical case. The terms in the application ontologies are, are either reference ontology terms which are reused or they are new terms designed for a particular local purpose. So reference ontologies have global validity or claim global validity. Application ontologies have local validity. All of these ontologies, however, are in constant works in progress, so that, that no ontology ever gets to be finished. And the gene ontology is updated every night, uh, not because there are major changes every night, but because the, even the small changes need to be kept track of. Now, the, uh, the first ontology which really captured some of what is involved in this strategy was the foundational model of anatomy, and so they, they introduced this terminology of canonical ontology. So canonically, human beings have 32 teeth. But statistically, we have 24.92 teeth. Uh, men, of course, have fewer teeth, and women have more teeth. So canonical here doesn't mean statistically normal. What it means is generated by the co coordinated <laughs> coordinated expression of the organism's own structural genes. Now, there is some element of statistics here because there is statistical variation across the human genome. But that statistical variation is, relatively speaking, rather small for very many kinds of phenomena. So we all have two legs, we all have two arms, we all have eight fingers and two thumbs and so on. There are many, many things which are common to practically all human beings. We all have water balance, which is almost always at the same level. And if you drink six pints of beer, it will revert to exactly the same level very, very quickly and consistently. Water balance is an amazingly universal phenomenon across all human beings. And that's because of the coordinate, coordinated expression of the same human genes. Um, this is a, a picture of the top level of the FMA to illustrate uh, how is our relations or subkind relations relate to part of relations. So the mesothelium of the pleura is a part of the visceral pleura, which is a part of the pleural wall of the sac, which is a kind of organ subdivision. And note that everything here is a kind. The instances which are your pleural wall of sac are instances of kinds in the ontology. So the ontology is like a taxonomy in the old-fashioned sense. It's about kinds or taxons. And now I hope Chris is listening. Just as we have canonical anatomical structures, such as hearts, lungs, kidneys, and so forth, so we have canonical biological functions. A biological function is a function which that's defined in BFO, so you can, I'll even give you a copy of the book if you promise to read it. It's a function which inheres in an entity that is part of an organism and exists and has the physical structure that it has as a result of the coordinated expression of that organism's structural genes. And then biological functioning is the activation or manifestation or realization of a biological function. Now, other things have functions, namely artifacts. So if you buy a new laptop, but you never switch it on, then it has all its functions, but no functioning. And if you buy a new dress, but never wear it, then the dress has all its functions, but no functioning. That's what Chris has to understand. Now, he can just nod his head, and I will be forever. <laughs> now, you could do it twice. 
<laughs> it just. All right, functions are continuance, functionings are occurrence. Now, there are functional genes and there are oncogenes and other kinds of bad genes. Functional genes are genes which have biological functions. Non functional genes may lack functions entirely, as far as we know, or they may have what we can think of as counter functions, bad counterparts of functions, uh, as in the case of ontogenes, and that means that they block the functioning of biological functions. And oncogenes arise from what are called proto-oncogenes, which, which may go by another name. And these are normal genes that become oncogenes through mutations or increased expression. So oncogenes began as normal functional genes, typically. And they went bad in the course of time and acquired these counter functions. And that's reasonable from an evolutionary point of view. You wouldn't want normal body parts to, be, to have a function which is to do bad things to the host. They, such body parts would have been eliminated long ago. All right, now back to emotions. Is grief pathological? Um, this is a quote from slides which David sent me at some point from you. The mental state of a grieving person is full of diminished functions, loss of interest in outside world, loss of capacity to love, and so on. Now, what you mean here is not diminished functions. You mean diminished functioning. The parts of your body whose function is, for instance, to um, inhibit are still perfectly functioning. Sorry. So they still have their functions. They're just not perfectly functioning. So it's as if you dropped your laptop. Many of the bits of the laptop still have their functions they're not going to function very well because other bits have been broken or uh, become wet or whatever it might be. Can I, can I just say fine? Okay. That would be, I, I, then I'll stop repeating. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> all right. Now, just canonical, we, with the, the emotion ontology is an ontology of canonical emotions and then extensions of the emotion ontology to deal with the non canonical varieties of emotions, which is suffered, for instance, by people with. Uh, dementia would be an application ontology which would build on the emotion ontology as its starting point. Now, a canonical emotion is an emotion of the most basic type. It's, it's that which the, that particular emotional repertoire evolved to satisfy. So, um, there are environments where, for instance, it's it, it, useful for survival to experience fear. When there's a lion in the corner of the room with you, it's useful to experience fear. And this goes hand in hand with the characteristics for fear in the canonical case, namely the fight or flight action tendency, uh, negative emotional feelings, uh, characteristically fearful expression, and characteristic appraisal, um, something is dangerous to me. If you can have all of those things without needing to think about it, because it's a, an evolutionarily basic response, you're more likely to survive and reproduce. And so your organism is programmed to give you this evolutionarily basic response when there is a dangerous animal in your uh, uh, location. So there is canonical fear. And then there are various kinds of non-canonical fears, some of which are healthy, so people say. So some people go to the movies to watch horror films, and they enjoy experiencing non-canonical fear, fear without real lions in the room. Other people have um, unhealthy non-canonical fear. For instance, they have phobias of various sorts. Um, similarly, some people have non-canonical emotions of a range of dis uh, different types because they have affect disorders, mental diseases which affect emotional fun fun uh, functioning of various sorts. So um, here we have a picture of the uh, principal um, 
kinds of entities involved in disorders of effect. So you have the mental disease itself, which is a disposition. Uh, here, depression is the kind of mental disease which uh, we're interested in. Depression is realized. Depression is like a counterfunctioning, a counterfunction. It's realized in something bad, which is sadness. In this case, non-canonical sadness, because there's nothing to be sad about. And that non-canonical sadness, that process has a part, which is a, a biological process of down-regulation of dopaminergic of the dopaminergic system, which is a biological process, which is a process. Now, pain. The International Association for the Study of Pain has an official definition of pain. It's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage, or described in terms of such damage. The described in terms of it is very interesting, because that means that this is ontologically incoherent. Um, there are many things which are described in terms of tissue damage which have nothing to do with pain. For instance, when you go to, the, um, go to your boss with a note which describes how you had a, a horrible fall yesterday and you think that you've cracked a mo bone, but you're just lying in order to get off work. That is a report of tissue damage. Um, so the... The basic case of pain, the evolutionarily basic case, is actual tissue damage which gives rise to an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience in just the same immediate way that we saw in the case of canonical fear. This is evolutionarily very useful because then you can avoid very quickly the dangerous tissue damaging phenomenon. And that means that the nociceptive system, the system which allows you to experience pain, is functioning properly. So you have out here trauma as a result of the fact that you just burned your finger. The trauma sends signals through the nociceptive system to your brain, which immediately and spontaneously gives you certain feelings. That's when things are working well. That's the case of pain with concordant tissue damage. So the pain is a strong as the tissue damage, as it were. If the tissue damage were weaker, the pain would be weaker. So there's a coordination. And then there are variant pains where you ca could have di a discordant level of tissue damage. So there is trauma, there is tissue damage in the place where you think the pain is being felt. Of course, it's always being felt in your brain, in fact. You think it's being felt in your finger. Uh, here, the pain is experiencing uh, the patient is experiencing pain, but it's either too low in intensity to match the trauma or it's too high in intensity to match the trauma. And then we have neuropathic nociception where there is no trauma at all at the periphery. You think that your finger is experiencing tissue damage, but because your nociceptive system is not functioning properly, uh, you experience pain, but that's because your nociceptive system is damaged, not because your finger has been damaged. And then there, is, uh, pain, there are pain-related phenomena without pain. So there are cries or reports of pain, uh, malingerers' notes. Um, the person who cries may think they have pain, but there is no pain. And then there is tissue damage without pain, where you should feel pain, but you don't, again, because there's something wrong with your nociceptive system. So this is the pain ontology branch of the um, emotion ontology. There is canonical pain, variant pain, pain-related phenomena without pain, pain behavior without pain, and tissue damage without pain. And then at the bottom here, there is lying about pain. Now, this is an application ontology, which is built uh, in collaboration with dentists. Uh, and it's being used in a, a quite um, uh, important dental uh, study of uh, TMJ, temporomandibular joint disorders. Uh, the, the reason for that is that these disorders seem to very often give rise to a large amount of pain, but with a very small or even zero amount of tissue damage in the relevant part of the jaw. Okay, that's a bigger picture of the pain ontology. Canonical pain involves an action tendency of withdrawal, a subjective, negative, tense, powerless emotional feeling, a characteristic response of a facial expression and withdrawal, 
and characteristic appraisal, something is dangerous to me. All right, that's the end of the ontology part. Now, I want to address very briefly the relevance of all of this to the philosophy of medicine. And there was a nice jokey interchange yesterday where um, uh, Jerry realized that he was using some of the same images as had been used earlier by Chris. And he said, it's pretty wonderful that we can use the same evidence for both of our conflicting positions. And then Chris said, isn't philosophy wonderful? Now, the correct response, of course, should, should have been, isn't philosophy embarrassing? Um, so I'm suggesting that the... On Uh, so you mean a, 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 one of these diagrams? Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. So the advantage. So what I'm suggesting is that we stop doing this narrative philosophy of medicine, and that we create an ontology of disease and an ontology of counterexamples to specific views of disease, and whatever else is needed in order to accumulate the kind of data that can really make progress in this field, which we would we would all accept. So building an ontology forces us to, to really formulate clear definitions and to assess those definitions in, to, to create consensus. Just the definitions. The ontology consists of terms, definitions. The definitions allow us, because they're formulated uh, using certain basic logical relations, to generate those diagrams automatically. It's the definitions which do the work. Um, and that's the way, that's what happens when you develop terminologies within other areas of science. Secondly, it encourages the use of the same terms to describe the same phenomena and thereby allow accumulation of evidence. So this is what physics discovered when they invented the centimeter. If everyone uses a centimeter, you can compare your results. Um, thirdly, it allows many different sorts of data in principle to be brought to bear on the testing uh, of hypotheses. And fourthly, you're going to need to do this anyway soon because the data about medical phenomena is going to become much more stratified. The, it, the, the classical phenotypic account of diseases is gradually being replaced, even in psychiatry, with um, an omics-based understanding of the physical structure underlying the phenotypes. Now, just very quickly, there is one term that I could find in the gene ontology which has some emotional relevance. This is the term determination of effect. So in each organism, they have to develop or determine various kinds of capacities. And one kind of capacity is to give an emotional response which is associated with a particular sensory stimulation. This is called effect. Now, the gene ontology provides eight annotations under determination of effect. In other words, they describe annotations to gene products, SH3 and multiple anchiorin repeated domains, protein 1, in the rat, and then various other counterparts in the mouse and the human, the dog, and I guess the boss, that's uh, boss Taurus, that's Cow. These are very similar proteins, at least the top six. The, the ones at the bottom are as yet uncharacterized. But you can go and look what they do know by going to these links. These are all URLs pointing to web pages. Now, what we want in principle is the same thing, but with much greater richness for all emotional phenomena. That's what the emotional ontology is the starting point for. Some of these annotations can be generated by computers searching literature. The good ones, and this is why the gene ontology has received so much funding, are created by human literature curators whose day job consists of creating entries like this around go terms. Now, grief in the medical subject headings is defined as a normal, appropriate, sorrowful response to an immediate cause. It is self-limiting and gradually subsides within a reasonable time. This is canonical grief. I don't recommend the mesh as a place to go to do this kind of research. It was developed when, when the, the computational possibilities uh, were not yet recognized, and so it's, it's, um, it, it's not going to give you everything that you would need. Um, if you go 
uh, back to Ogham's for a minute, one thing that you will certainly need is an understanding of normal physiological response. So this is the Ogham's account of influenza. You start with an infection of the airway cells, which creates a disorder, which is viable cells with influenza virus, which bears the disposition called flu, which, gives, which is realized. This is, the, this is the continuum disposition, and this is the occurrence the pathological process called acute inflammation, which produces the symptoms of weakness and so forth. Now, the point of all of this is that the disorder also induces normal physiological processes, immune response, that can result in the elimination of the disorder. The issue to, we have to face is whether grief is a disorder or a normal physiological response to disorder. And the Ogham's framework gives you the terminology to distinguish those things clearly and logically. So the Mesh says it's a normal, it doesn't say physiological, but it would be physiological. And then finally, what does SNOMED say? Now, SNOMED is better than Mesh. It's more modern, it allows computational representations, computational reasoning across data. Uh, in England, all clinical data has to be captured using SNOMED. And SNOMED is huge. And that brings all kinds of problems. Uh, but still, everyone should look at SNOMED. Uh, this is the SNOMED browser, which is created by an organization called ITSIDU. Uh, the ITSIDU maintains SNOMED. And SNOMED doesn't have the term grief, really, because it's designed for clinicians. It has the term grief finding, of which there are six children. So you could have the grief finding, this chap is adapting to loss following bereavement. That's a sub-kind of grief finding. And similarly with these others. And you see that there is some redu redundancy. So adapting to loss and coming to terms with loss seem to be a little bit redundant. Now, if you go to grief, you will find the term grief, but it really means grief finding. Uh, you will find 56 terms. This is just an example. Normal grief reaction, which would speak for your case, Chris. Acceptance stage of grief, conflicting stages of grief, anticipatory grief, and so forth. Um, and that's the end. Yeah. Uh, causes injury, and that's discriminated from spacecraft crash which yeah. causes injury. <laughs> so, um, uh, what I wanted to say is something about the um, emotional, which is, uh, I guess, would be my focus. Which is, it seemed like the way that you did it, or the way whoever did it did it, um, emphasized to the degree it has cognition built into it. It seems to reflect the classic Lazarus approach or the Beck approach, where cognition is somewhat of a trigger. Uh, like the appraisal idea, um, for these other, and then you had an array of other po of other phenomena that are associated with emotion. Uh, believe it or not, I actually took Lazarus' seminar at Berkeley and argued with him about this uh, during the semester, and that was, it under undersells the degree to which emotion transforms cognition. And I, I wasn't, looking at your chart, I didn't really see where the fact that as you become angry, your actual cognitions about the situation change. The focus of your attentional span changes, and so the dispositions, that's, I mean, that's partly why yeah. the dispositions to act change over time, and why if the terminating event that would lower the emotional level does not occur, we tend to cycle upward and have even more extreme emotions and even more extreme behaviors. Uh, all that that whole thing, which has seemed so important to emotion, I didn't see it there, but maybe I missed that. So we have thought about this, and so that we can make the necessary changes rather easily. So if you're building a database structure, and you need to add a whole new wing of influence, you, you often have to rebuild your whole database structure, because databases are very uh, inflexible. The ontology method allows you just to add a new uh, a new branch, which is about not physiological uh, consequences of emotions, but cognitive consequences of emotion. And uh, we talked about uh, the need for that branch. Um, remember that cognition primarily is perception. Um, 
And it's just not clear what the, how we're going to describe the influences of emotion on perception, the subsequent perception. And that we didn't add it yet because we're not clear how to deal with I it. Well, I just want to say it's terrific. I mean, I, mean, I think it, it does, it, it, it helps, just like the old stuff when we were talking about Shang Chang. But I mean, in addition to what it does pragmatically, it actually does provide an additional prod to think clearly. Yep. about all these various elements and how they go together, which I think is very useful. Yep. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rice downstairs, room 141, following people with glasses. Uh, if you wanted to sign that card for Teresa, I think Rob has Question it. real quick, if you have a second. Yeah, yeah just let me... Uh, but Gary, it's still about terms, not things. So it is ontology. But on. it's about terms, right? It uses terms to say things about things. Well... Did anyone want to sign the card for Teresa? I mean, in other words... Just to thank her for the comments. All right, fine. Thank you.